Well, Carlos uh, came to RTO a month after he got out of prison. And then Nelson was invited to give his testimony uh, a few months later. So both these men attended at RTO at very different times. So both Carlos and Nelson came to RTO at different times, one to give their testimony, one to get ministered to. And through that connection, we found out that Carlos had actually went to prison for murdering Nelson's son. Well, ever since I was a child, I, I come from an abusive home. Uh, my father was very abusive and uh, he used to beat us all the time. Uh, I, I got seven brothers, one sister, and um, we moved from, from Puerto Rico over here. And ever since uh, we came over here, we were struggling with, it was a small house, so everybody was crowded in. And uh, we were, he was always yelling at us, so he, he threw me out in the street when I was about 13, 14 years old. So I've been in the streets ever since I was young. I uh, slept in cars and wherever I can go. And um, that led me into gangs. And then from gangs to drug dealing. Uh, I had my family, my kid. I had my own son dealing drugs for us. In and out of prison all my life. Nelson used to be, for lack of a better term, a, a Scarface in Chicago type figure. He, he sold a lot of drugs and if you crossed him, he dealt with you in some form or fashion. Pastor Nelson used to be a really bad dude. The last bit that I did was in Stateville with uh, Ronnie. Um, I did, uh, they gave me seven years. I came out in 83, 84, and um, I started uh, dealing drugs real heavy. Had a couple of dope houses. And then um, one day uh, I ran into a girl in a club and she looked kind of different. She looked like she didn't fit there. And I had plans to try to move in so I could have a, another dope house that I could put my stuff away. Nobody knew about it. And she happened to be a daughter of a prayer warrior. Her mother called her and told her that I was praying and the Lord said that there's somebody living with you. He's not supposed to be there. And she told him no. Two days later, she called back. She says, I was praying, and the Lord showed me that this guy is sick, and uh, the Lord wants to heal him. Uh, about a week later, she called back her, my, my, my wife now. Uh, she told her, no, mom, there's nobody here. The third time that she called, she said, I seen him in a coffin. This is the last opportunity he's gonna get. You need to bring him to the church. That's when my wife broke down and told her, yeah, he's living here with me. And yeah, I told her, I don't believe in God. I'm a Puerto Rican, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. So a single mother. And we were um, raised, I was raised with two brothers, different fathers in a Humble Park community, which at that time and still to this day, you know, was a pretty bad place to grow up. And I think during my time, as you know, um, it was at its worst. So pretty much, um, you know, growing up, uh, uh, you know, you turn to the streets, you don't have toys, you know, you go to the streets and that's where you find your entertainment or whatever, or anything you're searching for. Cause it's one of those uh, kill or be killed type mentalities and or every man for himself. So, you know, you don't want nobody to run over you or take advantage. So you have to have this certain uh, um, personality or persona or something, you know, you have to be someone that you really ain't. And um, what happened there is, um, you just, I got worse. I ended up in gangs and... I said, well, you know, I've been suffering all my life. I said, there is no God. And uh, she says, well, just go. Go one time, if nothing happens, you don't have to go back. I told her, your, your, your mom is crazy, you know, bye bye. The moment that I said her mom was crazy, I got a sharp pain in my chest, fell to my knees. They had to rush me to the hospital, St. Mary's. Uh, they said they had to operate on me on because me uh, my heart was swollen the size of three hearts. And um, they didn't even know how I was alive. But I told them that I didn't want them to operate on me. I didn't want them to cut me. I, I just rather die. So I signed myself out, went back, and then I told her, I'm gonna go to the church one time. 
On the way, the day we were going to go to the church, they called me up early in the morning and said they needed like five, five ounces of cocaine. I, I told them that I was going to take it. I told her, I'm not going to go to church. I'm going to go and make this money. She said, well, drop me off at the church. So I said, okay, fine. I took, I took her to the church. As soon as I got there, she says, you, you haven't met my mom. At least go inside the church and talk to my mom. So the Lord was using her in wisdom. And so I went in there, forgot to take out of my gun, and I had my gun on me and walked into the church. I'm standing in the back. Next thing you know, I'm, she went to get her mom. I'm shaking. All of a sudden, I start crying. I haven't cried like for 20 years. Uh, it, and next thing you know, I ran to the front. I, I looked at the cross. I asked, I said uh, to, to the Lord, if you're God, don't let me leave this place the same. At that moment, I felt heat just come from my feet going upwards. Something I never experienced. It was just so powerful. Next thing you know, I just like left, and all I heard, all I felt was like a peace. And you know, peace to me was something like I never experienced because when you're a gangbanger, drug addict, you're always in fear. And so, when I felt that peace, I didn't want to move. But my wife said that when I looked at her, that my face was glowing. And that pastor told me, go to any doctor and tell them to check you because the Lord just healed you. Um, three months later, um, I, I was telling my son, because I had my son dealing for me, that's all he knew was gang banging and, and the drugs. So I, I told him, you got you to gotta come to Jesus. And he told me, Dad, you took some bad drugs. You're on a trip, but you're going to come back. I'm going to hold it down for you. And I told him, no, no, this is real. You got to come to Jesus. So I, you know, I, every chance I got, I, I try to tell him. Three months later, that day it was a Thursday. Uh, he came into the house and he told me, Dad, can I get all the weights? Because we you know we got the weights for weighing stuff and stuff to 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 cut it and all that. I had a bunch of stuff in bags that I was gonna throw out, and uh, he told me. Can I get that stuff? And I told him no. And I yelled at him, telling him, can't you see that I'm trying to do the right thing? You know, because the Lord had opened my eyes and now I see that I've been a bad dad. And so I told him, if you can't respect that, you got to leave. And he just got up and left. That was the last time I saw him. Uh, I went to praise the Lord. And uh, as I was worshiping, I remember the door opening. I, I heard the doors open in the back, and I look and I see my wife walking. She came. She just had a robe on and some slippers, and I said, "What is she doing here like that?" And I walked to her, and she told me they just killed Nelson. They shot him five times. I'm going to prison for murder, a gang retaliation murder, which was, um, you know, we do things to them, they do things to us, and when it, ha it happened to me, I had got shot. And after I got shot, I wanted to seek revenge, and... I just started screaming, looking at God, saying like, why? You know, I, 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 this is the first time that I wanted to, to show him that I could be a father. And next thing you know, uh, I went to the house. The, that, that night, the church stayed with me, the pastor prayed with me. From there, I went home and I remember for the first time I heard the voice of the enemy. The enemy told me, you killed them. And you, you raised them to be a game banger. You raised them to be a drug dealer. And now that he's, now that he's dead, you're hiding behind Jesus. You're not going to do nothing about it because you're a coward. And I remember taking the Bible and just throwing it against the wall and screaming and started breaking everything in my house and my wife was screaming, trying to control, trying to calm things down and next thing you know, I looked at the wall where I threw the Bible and the Bible was, the pages were flipping and they just were flipping and flipping by themselves. They just, and it just caught my attention and I was just crying and looking at it and I started walking towards it and I remember when I looked at it and the pages just kept turning knelt down in front of the Bible and when I went to touch it, it stopped. And the only, when I picked it up, the only words that I seen was, if you love your father or your mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. Pick up your cross and follow me. And I said, Lord, if you give me the strength, I will do it. 
I ended up going to prison for 20 years. I remember when the judge said, uh, he sentenced me to do 20 years straight in prison and he said, you didn't show remorse. I guess it's because I was carrying over that personality that you know, the enemy was molding me to be. And he said, I want you to show remorse those 20 years that I'm giving you. I want you to think on what you did. And that stuck with me for 20 years in prison. And I, you know, after I turned my life over to the Lord, I prayed on it and I said, Lord, I would love for you to restore that which the enemy has broken. And, and I wanted forgiveness. Praise God to this day, he has given me the strength. And um, I, the same church that I was saved, today I'm the pastor of that church. And that's the power of God. Carlos, when he became a believer, which was 10 years into prison, he was doing a little over 20 years in prison. So halfway through prison, he becomes a believer. I knew I wanted to approach Pastor Nelson Vargas pretty much in the last 10 years of my prison time. And of course, I had a big example of what it was to be forgiven because of what Christ did for us. You know, I knew my sins placed him on the cross. And yet, I still was asking God, I would love to reach out. I would love for you to make this possible where I could meet, you know, at that time I would say the victim's family because I didn't want to say Nelson. I didn't want to call him his name because I felt like, you know, who am I to say his name? So th that time, God was already in the works. You know, he knows, he sees so many steps ahead of the game. So we've been praying to have us this type of opportunity for over 10 years. Um, because by the time this all happened, he had been out for over a year. So at least 11 years he'd been praying for this. You know, I, I remember coming to RTOs and the first thing they ask you to do is, next time you come, we want to share a testimony. And, so I gave my testimony and RTOs, you know, we, we're a big family here, you know, and no matter what church we're at, we are a body. And uh, so God said, I'm using RTOs. One day I get a call. My wife actually gets a call from one of the sisters here named Diana. And she says, uh, uh, we just came from a great testimony. This man was just here. And, He's a pastor, and my wife said, is this name Nelson Vargas? The spirit told her to ask. Yes, how do you know, you know? And oh my goodness, we've been praying about this, and, and it's so funny, you know, how the Lord works and this and that. And, and so when my wife told me, I reached out to Neftali, and I, told, I, I casually said, hey, how was your day? I heard you had a, a man say a great testimony, and he's like, yes, it was awesome. And I said, his name Nelson Vargas? Yes, and I revealed to him. I said, well, that's the man whose son I killed. There is no handbook on, this is how you ask forgiveness from someone's family that you murdered a loved one. There's not really a handbook for that one. So it's not like I could even comfort him and say, oh, you know what, if you just do this, it'll be okay. I had no idea either. I'd never done this either. So there's no classes in seminary on, this is how you do this. Of course, you know, Neff was, um, concern with what Nelson might feel, what Nelson might think. And so he said, let's approach this gingerly. Let's see what God does. And I'm going to try to set up a meeting with him. And, and if the Lord wills it, I will ask him. And I will mention you to him and, and tell him that you're a part of RTO. And from what I hear, Nelson was, he was all for it. I was, like I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm coming from the same, same lifestyle, the same environment, you know, and God forgave me. And I said, then who am I not to forgive? You know, it's amazing because the way God works, because I've been praying for Carlos for many years, for the Lord to save him and use him. And um, it's easy to say I forgive him when you think you're never going to see the person. And at first, you know, you know, you say, yeah, that's fine, you know, glory to God. The day I met Carlos, on the way there, you know, I was telling my wife, I feel butterflies, I, I feel nervous. You know, they say old habits die hard. I kind of drove around the church, and I, that, knowing that my, I was in good hands, I still drove around the, the church and kind of like, uh, you know, scoped out the scenery, 
you know, to see the layout, see what was good, just to be safe. And I made it where I parked that I could get out fast. <laughs> and I remember that when we got to the, to the church, uh, they sat down and talked to us to make sure that we were in the right, I was in the right mindset. I was a little tense and nervous. And once I was in the church, I actually felt, uh, I felt safe, but still, um, you know, your, your stomach is, you know, turning and queasy and your, your rapid heartbeat and a little sweat and nervous. I, I you know, I'm gonna meet the man whose son I just, you know, murdered. I murdered him 20 years ago. And, and I remember as we were walking, when they felt that everything was good, pastor said, follow me. And we started going up the stairs. And as we took every step, I kept, my heart was beating stronger and faster, and I was nervous, my hands were sweating, and I remember as I seen the door, and my, uh, we walked in, and everything like froze. Pastor Nelson, this is uh, Carlos. I'm sorry, man. I really am. I just want you to know that. My son. For a moment, it was like everything just thing came to a standstill. And uh, Carlos looked at us. Next thing you know, he, he, he looked at us and my wife Thank you. Thank you. looked at him and she went to him and then she hugged him and she, he started crying and asking her for forgiveness. And then my son, my oldest son, he went to him. And then I remember inside like, you know, I felt like it's just really happening. And then he looked at me and said, can I get a hug? Can I at least get a hug? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No, I bless you guys. I'm sorry to be meeting you guys under the circumstances. No, I want you guys to know that um, you know, in the lunacy of all of it, I remember um, the judge, because I never got to understand. You know how when you're fighting a case and you're guilty, you're trying to figure out any way to win, and if you're losing, you're not going to get to understand. And I remember when I got found guilty, the judge said, um, a little before I got saved, he said, you know, you don't look like you're remorseful. And, and at the time, I, I probably wasn't, you know. But, um, he says, I'm going to give you this time and I want you to be remorse for every day. And you know, that always stuck with me. And so, like 10 years into, you know, being in jail, I got saved. And I've been praying for something like this. You know, like, I, it's, it's not easy, but I've been praying for somehow to bring restoration. You know, and I know it's not going to bring nobody back. And, and I'm not saying that. I would justify that, you know, that's not the case. No, no. You're just stupid and in bondage. In other words, it says that uh, we were naturally, you know, in sin, we were naturally disobedient, and, you know, children of malice and wrath, and that's, that was the case. You know, but I just... I uh, honor your courage. Oh, thank you. Your humbleness. I really um, thank God for this moment. I was you know, praying for years that you would get saved. It was part of your prayers. And I, would, I was hoping that one of these days I would meet you. Mm -hmm. you know, just like this, like we're meeting right now. The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And that the Lord delights in him. I thank the Lord for this moment and I ask the Lord that He will bless you, bless your home, bless your marriage, bless your children in the name of Jesus and that He'll continue to guide you and to lead you and to use you mightily, powerfully, the signs and wonders in these last days for the kingdom of God. Uh, I cancel every plan of the enemy over your life. Every plan that the enemy has spoken, we cancel that. We cancel every generation curse. Yes. Every generation curse over your children. Yes. And we ask the Lord that what he's spoken over your life, 
that that will manifest for this time. Yes. In the name of Jesus. And that one seed uh, that was for death will bring forth many of seeds. That you will give birth to many of children for the kingdom of heaven. For the glory and the honor of the Lord. I bless you. And that the peace of God will be upon you and his face will shine upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And give him all the glory and all the honor. And I accept your apology. And I love you. Thank you, Father. And I'm here for you. Ah, oh, thank you. just going to him and I hugged him he was telling me forgive me forgive me and I told him you're my son now thank you thank you no thank you he took my apology and he prayed for me I didn't see that coming at all and that's when you know God was already there but it was revealed to me how he took over and there's nothing impossible for Jesus nothing impossible Mm-hmm.